This is Twit. I wanted to bring you in to talk a little bit about our bite because the Department of Justice is doing something that they tried just a few years back and uh, this time it looks like they've got the ammunition to push it through. Let me give us all the background. Now, as reported by Ars Technica, the Department of Justice is once again making a case for weakened encryption, which is a euphemism for backdoor, in enterprise and consumer products and services. Now, you may remember that the Department of Justice made a big push into this area a few years back. They were beaten back. The tech industry was united in explaining to them why it was a bad idea to install backdoors into their products. And then they were joined by representatives from both sides of the aisle in Congress who actually understood the math of the problem. Well, it was only a matter of time, and now it's back. At a speech given this past Tuesday at the Naval Academy, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein said encrypted, quote, encrypted communications that cannot be intercepted and locked devices that cannot be opened are law-free zones that permit criminals and terrorists to operate without detection by police and without accountability by judges and juries, unquote. Now, in the speech... Rosenstein referenced the U.S. government versus Apple during the San Bernardino shooting case, during which Apple refused to break their own encryption technology. So, so that we don't get political, let me, let me make his case. Let me try to be as honest and, and true to what his arguments are, because I think he does have a case that he can make. Now, it appears that the Department of Justice has learned from their just trust us push last time. That's essentially what they're saying. They're saying, look, we're the DOJ. We're going to work with the intelligence agencies. You can trust us with the backdoor keys. We'll keep them safe. That didn't fly. So this time, it's much more nuanced. He acknowledged that encryption is important. In fact, he said, quote, encryption is a foundational element of data security and authentication and that it is essential to the growth and flourishing of the digital economy and that we in law enforcement have no desire to undermine it, under, unquote. So he understands that. That's a, a big area of sensitivity. However, he then takes one step forward, and he says that current encryption is warrant-proof and that our devices have engineered away the ability to give law enforcement access to data even with a warrant. So he drones, drones on for a while, but his, his cell was this. He knows that hardware companies typically maintain private keys that are used to sign software updates for their devices. What he's suggesting, or what he seems to suggest, is those keys are well guarded by the companies, so why couldn't the government guard them as well? Okay, so that's, I think that's an honest representation of what he's asked for. Of course, he's testing it out at a speech where it's going to be relatively popular, but now they're going to have to sell it to the public. Let's go ahead and open this up. Denise, you're our guest, so I'm going to give this to you first. This sounds like the same stuff that we got with the clipper chip and with the first and second and third rounds of backdoors. Is this really different or are they just using different language to make us think that it's different? I feel like you're on to something there that, that we're hearing sort of a question of semantics here. Uh, this also reminds me of the back and forth between Apple and the FBI uh, when they wanted Apple to write code that would have let them into the iPhone of the San Bernardino shooter. Uh, and Apple had a bunch of reasons why it wasn't going to cooperate with the FBI to make that happen. Those The legal bases that Apple was trotting out there never got tested by a court because, as we all know, the FBI got into that device without Apple's help. But one of the arguments that Apple would have made there and, and that companies other than Apple or along with Apple may make now in response to what you've just described is a First Amendment argument uh, because there is precedent out there that establishes that code can be speech protected by the First Amendment. So one of the things that Jennifer Gronick, the director of civil liberties for the Center of Internet and Society at Stanford Law School has said uh, that Apple's or any companies signing those digital encryption keys uh, is akin to their endorsement that the code is safe for people to run, uh, that cryptographically signing the software has a communicative aspect to it uh, that is... Um, compelled speech if you force them to do it. So I, I think that uh, they may have some 
constitutional arguments to make along those lines. All right. Now, uh, let, let's back up a little bit because you, you, we both brought up the, the San Bernardino case where uh, the government was trying to compel Apple to invent a technology. Uh, because you have to remember that the Apple encryption, Apple security was actually very tight, very well designed. There, there wasn't a set of keys that Apple could turn over to the U.S. government and say, we'll use these to get into the device. The, the U.S. government was actually trying to say, gather together some engineers, make a technology to break your encryption, and then give that technology to us, and we will only use it one time. Now, as you mentioned, that case was dropped before it went to a decision because the FBI said, well, we found another way to get in. Uh, but also, there was a lot of analysis at the time, and I believe uh, this, this came up on Twill, that the FBI didn't want this going to a decision, because if it did, it would, make, it would quite possibly create a precedent making their jobs even harder. It was, mm -hmm. was that about right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think that uh, both parties had their own reasons for being happy that they didn't have to take it further at that time. But, you know, if the Department of Justice heads down the road that you've described we may see those arguments being made again in a different context, different right. setting. Right. Uh, Lou, let me throw over to you. Now, there is an interesting sidestep that is taking place here because they know that if they jump into the, well, we just, we want to backdoor into the encryption. We want to backdoor into the encryption. That it's just going to meet the same resistance that they did last time, that the same experts are going to come out and say, you can't have weakened encryption. Weakened encryption is the same thing as having no encryption. So what the DOJ here is doing, and I, I think it's, it's, it's actually much better than what they did in the past, is they're saying, look, you can keep your encryption. However, the keys that you use to sign software that updates these devices, if we can get access to these keys, then we can force an update onto a device in question and bypass that. Because now we own the operating system, so it doesn't matter what encryption that they've, they've added onto it uh, aftermarket. Is... Is that really different or is it really just moving it slightly down the pipeline? So anytime you, you know, the, when anytime you give away the keys of the kingdom to more than one person, the, the less that security becomes effective. So now you're saying that, now they're saying, okay, well, hardware manufacturers have the key. I have the key because I, I know the passwords and things, ways to unlock it. Now somebody else. So now you have this three-way, you know, and again, your system is only as good as its weakest link. So... Now we're saying that we're also letting the government store these things, which haven't always been the most, the best for storing things that are secure. But let's say they are. Let's say theoretically saying yeah, they're pretty good at doing it. But that also doesn't stop them unless we establish a bunch of rules, regulations, and laws around the fact of when they can use them, which let's say we do do that as well. So, you know, now, now we're getting closer to what we really want is we reduce, you know, we potentially have one additional person that has the key to the kingdom. But they're restricted for when they use it, and they can only use it for during specific circumstances, and it's very secure. But to get to those points is, I would say, years of work. Um, years of work and millions and millions of dollars to get there. So, you know, I get the argument, but I don't think it's very soon. All right. Uh, now, Chibert, let me throw to you here because there's an interesting point to be made um, that I think you can uniquely make. Uh, you, you've had experience in this area, and that is... I think most of us would agree that law enforcement should, should be able to get in devices and access data once they've uh, uh, obtained a warrant. So if they've gone through the legal process, we believe that. We believe in the system of law. That's what we do here. However, the, the incongruency comes from the fact that that last part, after the warrant is issued, is how do you get into the device? And essentially what the DOJ is saying, what our intelligence agencies have been saying, what our government is trying to say is, just trust us. We won't abuse the power. Unfortunately, we've had way too many examples of them abusing that power. The exact same arguments were made when we established the FISA courts, that they would only use this in worst case scenarios. And now the FISA courts are being used all the time to grant these in the cover of darkness exemptions to constitutional rights. So where, how do you fix those? How do you go from, I want to support law enforcement to, I'm going to give you the keys and just trust that you're not going to do anything bad with them? Well, one of the things that I'll use an example from my private life instead of that life. <laughs> and that is um, I used to work with the second largest Internet service provider in the country for convention centers. Now, we trusted our employees, but we didn't really want to give them the master keys. 
So what we used to do is anytime one of our people were at a convention center and we needed to make some hands-on changes to, say, the boundary router, we would issue them a set, a, a, basically a, a password that was a one-time. I could get in once and it would immediately disable after we logged in. And so that worked out really well and we never gave away the master keys. I personally think, well, this is actually one of the conversations from my past life when I started proposing this on the Clipper chip because I was actually supporting not the original Clipper chip but a modified one where we would have one-time keys, one-time passwords, so that you would have to go through a very large minefield to get permission to even get that one-time key, but you would never, ever, ever get access to the master key. Um, that is my personal spin on how it could work someday in the future. Well, see, Hubert, here's the thing. We can do that now. That is a solution that is absolutely technically feasible, but that's not what they're asking for. And that's why it's got a lot of us who, who watch this for a living who are saying, if you're not asking for that, and instead you're just asking us to trust you, it means we shouldn't trust you because you know that this is a possibility. It's just not really a possibility that gives you what you truly want, and that is unfiltered, unfettered access to the data. Uh, let me go to you, Denise, because th there is a legal question here, and that is... The argument that is used most often is, well, once we get the warrant, we should be able to get the data. How difficult, what is the burden of proof on law enforcement to get that kind of a warrant? Because there's, there's, a, there's this weird thing that we've got in the world of technology where law enforcement suddenly has access to so much more information than they would have in, say, the, the 60s or the 70s. It's, it's at their fingertips. It's, it's up in the cloud. It's on these devices that are connected 24-7. And the allure of being able to access those devices anytime they want is almost impossible to ignore. But taking away the fact that they'd like to access that data, how much of a burden of proof do they have to actually get a warrant to access that data? You know, I'm not a criminal lawyer and have never practiced criminal law in my life, so I don't know the exact standard of proof that they're held to. But it is an exacting standard. They have to come in and convince a court, we are conducting this investigation. We reasonably believe that information vital to the investigation is on this device and we need access. Now, now where it gets complicated is lots of other things are on that device too. And courts have stepped in and reigned in the actions of law enforcement when they have decided, oh, okay, we've accessed this device in according to this warrant where we told the court we were looking for uh, information in one category, but oh, we also stumbled on other things in a completely different part of the device that led us to know some other wrongdoing had happened too. Um, and, and they are restricted from being able to do that. So, so they've got a couple of uh, gateway protections. Number one is getting a warrant is not just a rubber stamp from the court. You do have to go in and demonstrate uh, why you need access to that device uh, in the service of carrying out your investigation. And secondly, you don't just have free reign to uh, delve through every file on the device in conducting that investigation. You can, I mean, you know, the classic example or, um, oh, sorry about that. Uh, the That's the FISA court. They'd uh, like to have a word with you. Right, exactly. Um, the uh, Sorry, between shows, I've moved the phone back in here. <laughs> Silly. Uh, anyway, uh, they, they can't just go rummaging through everything they find on the device. And what I was going to say is, you know, people's uh, personal photographs and things are kept on the same devices that their plot to um, commit massive fraud might also be kept on. So the, the court does and can get involved to make sure that only uh, the files that are relevant to the investigation are subject to the investigation. Right. Uh, Denise, there's there's an interesting corollary to this debate, and that is the fact that LE, once they get into a device, let's say your smartphone, they have access to a lot more information than just what's on the device. It's whatever your device is connected to. Is is that differentiated in the law? Is, is a cloud-connected service that's accessible through the phone, is that served by the same warrant for the phone? I think law enforcement would say that it is. And I think that that is an, a very open issue 
under the law. If you are logged into things on your device that is properly accessed by law enforcement, I think you get what you get. You know, you might be able to come in and object and say, uh, it was beyond the scope of what was reasonable to have foraged through my Facebook or Instagram account. But if you're logged in and they can convince the court that it's relevant, I think you're out of luck. All right. Well, Lou, let, let me jump over to this. Let's 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 move forward a little bit and actually talk about some of the practicals of doing this. So the DOJ, essentially what they are suggesting, and of course it'll be more fine than this, but they'd like all keys to access the hardware, no matter what it is, a smartphone or a networking switch, to be accessible by the DOJ, somewhere where they can get access to it. Not in the way that Chibert suggested, which is one-time use, but sort of trust us with the master keys and we promise we won't do anything bad with them. Is this something that the regular, typical, non twiet audience will understand? Will Joe Schmo on the street understand what it means that the government controls the keys to install software on his phone? No, I, I, think, I don't think they're going to understand that. I think they're just going to understand that we're just letting the government access their privacy and giving them the keys to the kingdom. I, I like to put an analog in this as well as kind of throw this out there is I like to correlate this to, um, you know, device management by enterprises. So when I put my device on a network, I might be um, stepping into or agreeing to being part of device management where they can you know, remotely wipe your device or remotely wipe data that you're on your device, look at, you know, you know, touch your email, remove, remove files on your phone that might be related to them. Um, and so you're kind of giving up really your device to that enterprise. Um, and, and I don't necessarily see a difference between the two here. So I think that that's also something we should probably discuss. But in the same sense, um, you know, if normal consumers are not going to really understand what we're actually giving up here. And I think that's the problem is if we go in to vote about this and add some stuff to the law, people are not going to really understand what they're really giving up. Chief, what about that? Actually, that's a great point. Is it time to educate the public as to what they're giving up? Don't try to explain, explain the law. Just say, look, if, if you're okay with this, these are the things that you've considered rights previously that are no longer your rights. Is, is that the way to educate? You know, I've tried all kinds of things. I There's always been problems with educating the public. There are going to be – vast majority are probably going to understand. But then there's going to be a whole bunch of people that don't understand, can't be educated about it, and are going to be really, really vocal. Um, so the reality is, is yeah, education is going to have to be there. Um, the world is changing. There, there are certain things we are going to have to probably give up. You know, I I think it's in the same category as, you know, what what channels am I watching on my cable box? And that that metadata is being collected. I think the same things are going to start happening with a lot of electronic devices. And it's a sad factor in this new world. 